Well, the best Batman villains have a little window through which you can see their humanity. That's what sets them apart from characters with fancy gizmos and bizarre powers. When you can see that little bit of who they were or who they're striving to be again, then you really emphasize with the characters and that makes them more of an anti-hero or even in some cases a true hero than a, than a villain. Pretty cool, huh? Party Quinn started off as basically just as a way to kind of um, keep the idea of having Joker having henchmen you know, fresh, because every, every episode he'd have different henchmen, and uh, Dini had the idea to change it up and give him a, a to give the Joker a henchwoman, and he thought of the name Harley Quinn as a kind of a pun on the classic Harlequin. And I thought, let's kind of hark back to the 60s show and do a kind of gun mall type, but let's make her kind of funny. So I just wrote her in on the spot, just like any other hench person, and just started giving her jokes because I liked the idea that she would get a laugh and sometimes the Joker would scowl at her because the, the other henchmen would laugh at her joke. It was just kind of like we put her in the show and she was fun and we moved on, didn't think about it. And then when we um, got the episode back animated from overseas, we kind of went, oh, this is actually quite nice. This is a really interesting character and she's really appealing and, you know, she looked great on screen and she was funny and she was sexy and it was just kind of like, huh, well, how about that? If you've got a story about the Joker terrorizing an innocent guy, it you need a couple of laughs in the things. You need lighter moments. And Harley just seemed to provide those from the get-go. She was the Joker's sounding board. She was someone for him to talk to. She could be playful. This time, Davey, the joke's on you. Histrionic uh, personality disorder is a, a personality disorder that sometimes used to be called hysterical, not in the haha sense. And it's, it's basically characterized by people who like to be the center of attention and go out of their way to, to get that attention. And they're also pretty emotional. Um, and so, for instance, they may act in sexually provocative or just in general provocative ways, wear provocative clothing. So I think that Harley definitely has, uh, you know, the histrionic personality disorder features. There's a little bit of Sherlock Holmes to her, I would say, also in the fact that while people are are treating her like the the giggly blonde, she is sizing people up and studying them in, 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 a, in a very intuitive way. That comes from her being a psychiatrist and from being able to read people uh, very, uh, very quickly. And that's an element of her personality that I like an awful lot. I haven't had a lot of chances to use that in animation, but the more I write her in comics, the more I get into that, and the more that that becomes a, um, one of her many weapons or, or the tricks that she can use to outwit an opponent. It's all about uh, appearing to be something you're not, and she understands that very well. You think I'm just some dizzy airhead that don't know nothing. Do you know what I am? My punishment for dropping out of med school. Eh, wrong. I'm the answer to all your prayers, Pally. Harley is very deceptive in that what you see and what you hear isn't always what's at work there. She's got a little bit of, like, Tweety Bird in her also, where you underestimate Tweety because Tweety is small and appealing and talks with a little squeaky voice. Um, but Tweety is pretty pretty savage and can, can really deal with any opponent. And it's the same with Harley. Yeah, dangerous loony over here. Never know what she's gonna do. It's possible that as a part of her, the histrionic characters that she expresses that her voice is another kind of attention getting, look at me, look at me. Certainly her, her costume has that, but that's true for any costumed hero or villain. Um, but the voice, it is confusing to see an adult woman speak in that way. Well, when I was writing Joker's Favor, uh, in my head was a the voice of a snappy blonde when I was writing her dialogue. And I'm good friends with Arlene Sorkin, who's a comedic actress, who at that time, that was sort of her, uh, an element of her stage persona, was the wisecracking New York type girl. And 
I made a connection between the two of them, and I thought, well, maybe there's a, a little bit of inspiration there. It's kind of a kind of a classic type, the brassy Brooklyn girl. Paul seemed to to, to write her dialogue to kind of reinforce that in her her kind of she uses this kind of like like old school 40s you know gangster slang and stuff. Um, and then then Arlene just kind of came in and just did it, and it was like kind of exactly what we wanted. Typically, Dr. Quinzel's voice was an adult voice. Hi, Joan, call me Harley. Everyone does. And Harley Quinn's voice is more childish. It's high-pitched. She speaks with more colloquial slang. One explanation for that is that in her abusive relationship with the Joker, that she tries to be one down from him and sort of childish, making him the top dog, if you will, and, and therefore not a threat. Because when she's competent, she typically does threaten him and he gets angry. I mean, it threatens his sense of himself and masculinity. And so, you know, in that sense, her speech pattern and pitch is duplicitous and you can underestimate her. Bye bye She was basically just Funny and cute and kind of kind of deadly um, originally, and she started developing different aspects of her personality the more we dealt with her. Um, I think the big turning point came when we did when Paul and I did the uh, the Mad Love comic book, which was her big origin story. There's a lot of subtext to Mad Love, and it a lot of it is on the page and some of it the reader can make a kind of logical uh, jump and fill in some of the gaps. But with that story, more than anything, we wanted to show that Harley slash Harleen Quinzel was a very complex person and a very intelligent one, very driven personality, and also show that she is a, a tragic personality as well. That in, there's a difference, I think, between being a victim and also being, you know, a, a tragic character. And her, the tragedy of Harley is that she loves too much and too unwisely. At what point did my life go Looney Tunes? How did it happen? Who's to blame? It was always intended to be a comic. Um, later on, we did adapt it to, to animation. Um, and uh, we did have some issues with BSNP at that point in terms of some of the, the more problematical uh, adult nature of the comic. Um, but it was all relatively minor. I mean, the idea that, that she was in this kind of codependent you know, abusive relationship with the Joker it wasn't really an issue with them. It was just literally a matter of, oh, you know, violence against women, Joker can't hit her, he can't do this, he can't do that, and oh, the scene where she's trying to seduce him, that has to be toned down. And, but it was all really minor, you know, notes. It was all very specific. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the broader theme of it seemed to kind of went, went over their heads, so. Face it, Harl, this stinks. As formidable as she is going up against other people, she does have that quirk in her personality that she is uh, an enemy to herself as well. And Mad Love, we really wanted to, ex to explore that and, and create an entire person, to show there was an entire character there as much as we could, and as much as we knew her about her at the time. But I think it works very well. And so at the end, you look at her not only as a, you know, a villain and somebody who has, you know, started this caper and failed, but also sort of a tragic character, somebody that you empathize with a little bit and you feel for. And uh, I think a lot of people respond to that. I feel like despite your best intentions, sometimes you wind up being your own worst enemy. She is an innocent in, in all senses of the word when she starts to become Harley Quinn. She was a good person. She was trying to help people. And the Joker kind of threw her off her path. I think that uh, Harleen Quinzel likes a challenge. For someone to voluntarily work in a prison setting, they have to like a little risk. And the Joker, although she prepared herself for all of his shenanigans, uh, he knew how to play her. And he got her in her soft spot, and she fell in love and wanted to basically be his champion. And
And in doing so, she then began what I would characterize as an abusive relationship built on a fantasy of who the Joker was and that she never really looks at who he actually is because he's not, in fact, very nice to her unless he wants something from her. It really gave a sympathetic backstory to somebody who was really a crook. To see where she came from and to have had her be the Joker's shrink was a genius idea because it just shows that you can't help the Joker because he won't let you help him because he will find a way to hurt you first. And that's what he does with Harley. I think there's something very universal in the way that Harley thinks about the Joker and that he, he symbolizes temptation to her. It wasn't like I was trying to say all women are like this or all men are like this. I was trying to go for a more universal uh, feel with that, and that was just the vehicle I, I chose to use it in. But we've all fallen for the wrong person. We've all put ourselves down, and because we've we thought more of somebody else because they bring something more to us. And I think he loves what he has turned her into, almost in a sort of a Pygmalion type way. He fell in love with an aspect of his creation. Like he thought like, oh, you know, here's this doctor and I can kind of maybe play her for a dupe or maybe have a little fun with her. And then she became something not only on his level, but even surpasses him in a way. And I think that there is a weird sort of attraction from him toward her on that aspect of like, wow, that. I hadn't expected that. I don't think he is capable of love quite in the same way that a rational person is, but I think there are elements of Harley that he does really adore. For her, I do think love is blind because I, I you know, she's not seeing the transactional nature of the way of his, his relationship with her. I think that he hardly loves him, um, whatever that means to her. And he was the impetus for her transformation. And so if she's not with him, kind of why is she Harley Quinn and not Harleen Quinzel? And maybe that's part of what perpetuates her love for him. Harley as a character has changed over the years, but almost always in relationship to changes in the Joker. We can think of Harley as the moon around the Joker's sun. And so as he changes, she too must therefore change because otherwise their relationship has to change by definition. The stories where Harley is out of the Joker's orbit, you know, where she's with, with the gals, she becomes a different person, whoever she's with. She's, she is someone who is really responsive to her environment. And so her changes really just reflect a change in her environment. I would not say that they're particularly internally driven, except that, you know, occasionally she dips into the morality she had as Dr. Quinzel and will not take a life. Um, but, but otherwise, who she is, is is a function of who she's with. Over the years, Harley's kind of evolved. When we did this story, I, because she's become so popular on her own, I kind of wanted to just ignore the Joker completely. Oh, shucks. Because she's a strong enough character that she can, you know, at this point in her career, can kind of stand on her own. So um, wh whether we'll bring the Joker back in, in future stories, I don't know. I kind of am reluctant to do so if we do another Harley story after this. I still kind of like to avoid the Joker, um, just because we've done a lot of it. and. There's other kinds of stories we can tell with Harley that don't necessarily revolve around her being the Joker's, you know, um, love interest or former love interest or whatever they are anymore. I don't want to see her being the hench girl forever with, with the Joker. I'm done with capes and tights and masks, just trying like hell to lead a normal life. The Joker's not in this movie, so she's trying to stay away from him because she knows what kind of a bad influence he can be on her. Uh, but. Unfortunately for her, some of her other friends are still crooks. Her character is such that, you know, she's really responds to the people she's with. 
you know, she really mirrors them. And so if she's hanging around superheroes, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, can she, and she kind of isn't around supervillains so much. Let's see what kind of anti-hero she can turn out to be. Harley Quinn, Harleen Quinzel, is someone who is a risk taker who seeks out highly stimulating activities. And so being a superhero would be a good fit for her. And, and, and in general, she has a very core kind of moral spine, if you want to think of it that way. And I think that she likes feeling useful and appreciated, although, you know, sometimes Joker appreciates her and sometimes he doesn't. So I think it's an interesting question of can she stay on the straight and narrow? I would argue that many superheroes in the DC universe are not really on the straight and narrow themselves. She's not going to be like Superman. You know, she's, she would never be a goody two-shoes type of superhero. But I think it's an interesting question. Is there a way to channel her uh, desire for risky behavior in a kind of anti-hero superhero way? She's always going to be on the other side of the law, like Catwoman. Catwoman can never be 100% of a heroine. I don't think Harley can be 100% evil, but she's always going to be not entirely righteous as well. But I think people can live with that. And I think that she just represents our wild side that just wants to do good for, uh, for ourselves in that moment and just hopes for the best. God help us. Whatever is good for Harley is good for Harley in that moment. If Harley loves you, she loves you completely. If she hates you, she will destroy you completely. That's, I, I always feel like there's very little middle ground with the character. So Batman recognizes, I think, that she has skills and abilities and, and talents that are useful to him, properly controlled, but he's never gonna trust her completely. He's never gonna wanna work with her as a full-time member of the team. But I think that at best she can be a useful ally provided he keeps her in front of him and doesn't turn his back and watches her. See, that was fun, right? She's become one of our kind of anti-hero characters where she can sometimes do some shady things, sometimes do some good things, but she'll always do them in a crazy way. And that's the fun of watching a Harley Quinn show. <laughs> Harley's popularity is just one of those things that kind of, I, I wasn't even really completely aware that it was happening until it had already happened. Why is she so popular with people? I don't really know. You know, it's, it's interesting because on one hand, it's a, it's a little freaky because she's not exactly what I would call a role model, you know, um, because of her, her kind of tangled history and her kind of, you know, some of the darker aspects of her backstory. Well, Harley's all about resilience. I mean, she is a character who pops back up with a big smile on her face, no matter what stands in her way. And she does not take anything very seriously. She uses humor as a weapon to get out of situations, to uh, take control of situations. And I think that's very empowering because the person who can make another person laugh has got a big advantage over somebody who's who's a bully or who can just threaten. We all think of her as this overnight success, and it's like it's it was slow build. Her popularity was kind of on a slow burn for about 10, 15, 20 years, and then just suddenly just kind of exploded. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, so she's definitely having a moment. She's really super popular at the moment. Um, whether she's going to continue to be and to, and to continue to get bigger and bigger, who can say? Since she has evolved so much through things like her comics and Suicide Squad, I see her going and being Harley far beyond me and far beyond, you know, anybody currently doing comics, that she's going to exist and still be that wild, uh, unhinged, unpredictable, happy-go-lucky character, but a character who is sort of chaotic good more than anything. It has always felt very good for me to uh, see the character go from a character that I truly loved writing and creating and, and seeing the evolution of, to seeing other people take to her, to see the character endure over the last 25 years, to see kids dressed up as her. It just, it makes me feel like uh, I did my job. 
you know, I was, I was put here to do something and I did it. I, I don't know, as a, as a creator who works, who has worked a big chunk of their career on other people's creations, to have a hand in creating something that not only adds to the canon, but also endures as a, as a character on its own, it's tremendously gratifying. And it also feels like it's a start. I want to do that again. I want to do more characters like that and create more things because it's very empowering for me to see people enjoy the character in all the forms she's been in, whether it's been superhero girls or Lego or uh, Suicide Squad. The character translates in, into a bunch of different venues and, and people seem to like her in all those, those venues. I hope that people long after I'm gone are still enjoying the character. Harley Quinn reporting for duty, sir!